This is a 1963 Ferrari 250 GT Lusso, and it's one of the most beautiful and sought after Ferrari models ever made. It's also one of the more valuable. The current market price for one of these is somewhere between two and three million dollars, making it the most valuable car I've ever reviewed. And today, I'm gonna show you why it's worth every penny. To start, I should mention that I borrowed this 250 GT Lusso from Tamini Classics here in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. They have an excellent staff and an amazing inventory of all the cars I always wanted when I was a kid. All the cars I knew I would never be able to afford when I was a kid. You can check out their inventory if you click the link in the description below. So let's talk Lusso. Ferrari only built this car in 1963 and 1964, and they only made 350 examples for the entire world. A rare older Ferrari is always going to be valuable. For example, the Ferrari 250 GTO from this same era would sell at auction today for about $40 million. But while Ferrari only made 39 250 GTOs, roughly 350 is, by comparison, a huge production run, so these aren't worth as much. Plus, this is a more luxurious Ferrari. The GTO was a race car, but this was a road car aimed at customers who wanted something special, but they still wanted all the creature comforts of its time period. Still, the Lusso was absolutely incredible. Under the hood is a 3-liter V12 that made 240 horsepower and 178 pound-feet of torque. Lacking all the modern safety equipment and technology, this car only weighed 2,400 pounds and did 0 to 60 in 7.5 seconds. Now, by modern standards, none of those numbers are all that impressive, but back in the day, in 1963-64, this was the fastest road car on the planet. It could do 150 miles an hour. It's also one of the most beautiful. It was and still is this gorgeous Pininfarina design body. Simple, elegant, classy. This car doesn't have a bad line or a bad angle. And now I'm going to review it. As usual, I'm going to start by showing you all of the interesting and cool quirks and features of one of the most special and most beautiful older Ferrari models in existence. Then I'm going to take it out on the road and drive it, which I'm already nervous about. And then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And check out autotrader.com slash oversteer for more of my thoughts on the Lusso experience. Now I'm going to start around back where this car has a couple of quirks, starting with the tail lights, or the brake lights and turn signals I should say. You see modern Ferraris have two circles in back, one for the brake lights, one for the turn signals, but this one only has one circle. It's half brake light, half turn signal. I guess Ferrari was trying to simplify back then. Now when you get under the trunk, the trunk just opens up like a trunk, and when you get back here you will find the fuel filler cap, the gas cap is in the trunk. Ferrari didn't want to compromise the beautiful lines of this car with a gas cap and a fuel door, so instead they stuck it in the trunk. The drawback there is that the hose leading from the fuel filler cap is also in the trunk, sharing space with your luggage. <laughs> That's always nice to have gasoline and luggage in the same place. Now another interesting thing about the trunk, you'll notice that it's just sitting here propped open. That's because it has this really cool latch design. You open the trunk far enough and then the latch catches and then it stays open. There isn't a stupid prop to keep the trunk open like in a lot of cars. Instead, they actually engineered this pretty well. It's a cool feature. Now that same latch design is used under the hood also, so that when you open up the hood and you latch it in place, it just stays open, meaning that this car has no hood prop, which was very forward thinking for its time. Now, there are a couple of interesting things under the hood, one of which is the washer fluid bag. Yes, that's right, the washer fluid bag. In your car, the windshield washer fluid is in a plastic tub, but in this car, they stuck it in a bag. Now, race cars still do this to save weight, but people at Tomini Classics tell me this was common in Ferraris of this era. Also also cool and under the hood, it shows the firing order of the cylinders, 1 through 12, in this diagram. And look at this diagram, it's so beautiful and so Italian. I should get this thing blown up and frame it and put it on my wall. Now before I move inside, you might be wondering, what are these little silver, well, I guess plugs for lack of a better term? Well, it turns out those are jacking points for when you had to remove the chassis from the body, for when you physically had to separate the two and lift the chassis off the body. This is clearly a very different car from a very different era if it was built with the idea that you may have to take the chassis off the body in order to do repairs or maintenance in the future. It's quite interesting. Before I move inside, here's something hilarious. You know how some cheap sporty cars will sometimes have a fake vent on the outside to make them seem more aggressive? Yeah, well, so did Ferrari in 1963. This is fake, doesn't do anything. So even the best take some liberties for appearance. Next up, moving on to the interior. Before I go over the quirks and the weird features of the interior of this car, 
I want you to just take a look at how beautiful this interior is. This is a sports car, yes, but it was also the luxury model at the time, and this car came from an era when luxury did not mean gadgets or tech or features, but rather craftsmanship and workmanship. This interior has been restored, but this is how it basically would have looked when it came out of the factory. It is just gorgeous. The leather in the seat, the smell of the leather, the wood steering wheel, everything is just wonderful. A lot of people say vintage cars look like works of art. When you get inside this car, you know exactly what they mean. Also, this car previews some things that Ferrari has carried forward to the modern era and still does today. For example, the diamond stitching you see behind the seats, Ferrari is still putting that behind the seats in their V12 front engine two seat cars. And that parcel shelf back there with the little leather straps for luggage, Ferrari is still doing that too. You can sort of see how these evolutions begin when you get in a car like this. But just because it's beautiful doesn't mean there aren't any quirks. And so we must begin with the door panel, which has one of the most interesting door locks I've ever seen. You know how in your car the door lock is a little tiny thing up here that you push and then the door is locked? Well in this car it's this giant silver handle. You pull it forward in order to get out of the car or you push it and then the door is locked and that's the only way to lock the door from the inside. That is the door lock and it's massive. It's the biggest door lock I've ever seen. Now since that handle is how you open the door and how you lock it you might be wondering how to close the door once you get inside the car and the answer is it's this little handle mounted at the top of the door panel. You pull it in order to close the door and then it swings out and and then you just continue pulling until the door is closed. It's just that simple. And the other thing on the door, obviously, is the window crank. Some of you younger people probably have never seen one of these before, but the rest of us remember this. You roll it and then the window rolls up and down. No power windows in this car. Now moving on to the interior itself, I start with the gauges. Now the speedometer and the tachometer are in the middle in this car. They're right above the gear lever in the center, like in the BMW Z8 or in the Tesla Model 3 or in the Saturn Ion. Now that's because Ferrari decided the gauges you really need to see, the gauges they should put right in front of you, are more important. And that would be fuel, water temperature, oil temperature, and oil pressure, and also the clock, which is running beautifully, I might add. Those were the gauges Ferrari felt were actually important, then the tachometer, and the speedometer goes the furthest. That's the one you least need to see. After all, on the racetrack, you don't care about your speed. Now the interesting effect of this is that when you put on the turn signals, the turn signal indicators are in the speedometer. So they're like three and a half feet away from you. So you have no idea really whether the turn signals are on or off at any given moment unless you look all the way over to the passenger side of the cabin where the glove box would be in a normal car. Oh, and speaking of the glove box, this car has no glove box, and usually when cars have no glove box, the automaker scrambles to find other places they can cram storage into so you have somewhere to put stuff. But not this car, there's also no center console storage, although there are little pockets on the doors. There's the rear parcel shelf with the diamond leather, and that's it. But back to the gauges and the placement of everything. When you're driving this car and your hands are on the steering wheel, the two things in easiest reach of your right hand, that would be the gear lever, of course, no surprise, and also the cigarette lighter. Yes, this car is fitted with a cigarette lighter, and yes, it is incredibly close, closer in fact than the speedometer and the tachometer, so you can always light your cigarette because Ferrari in the 60s in Italy they knew who was buying this car. Also, while they skimped on a glove box and a center console, they did give you an ashtray, also placed very close to the driver. And I love how this ashtray opens. You don't just pop it open like every other car. Instead, you push this little silver circle at the base of the ashtray, and it pops right open. It's, it's such a nice design, and it's very beautiful. The next interesting thing worth noting, back to the gear lever, it just sort of sticks out of the center console in this leather shift boot. And my favorite thing about it is that Ferrari has included little notches where you're supposed to put your fingers when you're shifting gear, just in case, you know, you don't know. Now, right above the gear lever and below the center gauge is probably the craziest thing about this entire interior, and that would be the switches and dials where you control everything, like, for example, the window defogger or the wipers. Now, the weird thing about these is not how they're placed, but rather how they look. There are seven different switches and dials in the middle here, and they all look the same, and they're all unlabeled, so there's absolutely no way to know which one controls which thing unless you really know this car. And you don't want to start jumping in there and randomly pulling on them because one of them controls the fuel pump and it'll shut off fuel to the engine, which of course will stall the car, and one of them controls the wipers, and so you really better know which is which before you start pulling them. If you're in a rainstorm and you pull the wrong thing, it could stall you out instead of turning on the wipers. I've never seen this before in any car, but this is the early days of putting these kind of switches and dials 
styles and cars, and this is how Ferrari decided to do it. Ah, the Italians. Next up, moving on to the driver's side footwell. Usually this is a pretty boring space in cars, but there are a couple of interesting things in the driver's side footwell in the Lusso. Starting with the parking brake. In order to disengage the parking brake, you pull it towards you, and then you push it away to let it off. In order to re-engage it, you just pull it towards you, and it engages like a normal parking brake, but it is sort of an odd operation. Also interesting down here is the hood release, which isn't located on the side of the driver footwell, but rather right in the middle, and it's this black lever with a big ball attached to the end of it. It's a bit of an odd piece. And then we have my favorite thing down in the driver's footwell, and that would be the windshield washer fluid. No, the windshield washer fluid is not controlled with one of the seven unlabeled dials in the middle for some reason. Instead, it's controlled by your left foot. You push on this little black thing above the dead pedal, and that squirts windshield washer fluid onto the windshield. And I say squirts because I mean squirts. It comes out in little tiny streams depending on how much force you give it with your left foot, and it only produces as much windshield washer spray as you push on it with your foot. So once you're out, you have to push on it again and again to get more spray. It's kind of hilarious. But beyond the switches and the buttons and the little pedal where you turn on the windshield washers, there are a couple of other interesting quirks in this car. For example, there's no seat belts. This car didn't come with seat belts. In fact, it was an option. You had to choose whether you want seat belts. Just like today, you choose whether you want forward collision warning. And back then, that safety feature options were seat belts. Also optional was mirrors on the outside of the car. You had to decide whether you actually wanted mirrors. And the cars were delivered to the dealers with no mirrors. Mirrors were a dealer installed option. So what happened was the customers would come in. They would say they wanted a driver's side mirror or both sides. And the dealer would then install the mirror. And the customer would choose where he wanted it. That leads to a lot of variation in mirror placement. The next time you see a Lusso at a car show or at Pebble Beach, you'll probably notice that the mirrors are in a different spot than they are on this Lusso, and now you know why. Also interesting, although this is only a two-seat car and obviously the front windows go down, the rear quarter windows also open up, which I find very hilarious. It's almost impossible to even reach them to open them, and I don't know why you'd want to open them anyway. And that's especially true considering the car doesn't have back seats or back seat passengers to enjoy the open windows, but they're there and you can open them if your hands reach far enough. And then of course we get to the horn. A lot of Italian cars from this era had a weird horn and this one is no different. Take a listen. Also cool is this quarter window in the front. You can open it to allow more air to flow into the cabin while you're driving, which is a nice touch I wish modern cars still offered. And finally, we have simply turning the Lusso on. The key is mounted over on the left, and to turn this car on, turn it just like a normal key, but then you push it in, and that's how this thing starts. So those are all the cool features of the Ferrari 250 GT Lusso. Not as many interesting quirks as some of our modern cars with more gadgets, but it's still pretty interesting. And now it's time to get out on the road in the Lusso. All right, time to drive the Lusso. There's no seat belt, which is already kind of an odd feeling. You don't want to crash the Lusso. Not only because you don't want to crash the Lusso, but because you don't want to die. This is so cool. <laughs> There's nothing cooler than driving an old Ferrari like this and looking out the wood wheel as you drive. It's just the coolest thing. I feel like all those guys at Pebble Beach who drive these things around and everybody stares at them and wonders who they are. Oh, this is so cool. I mean, this is one of the all time experiences. This car is one of the most special, one of the most beautiful. It's amazing. Driving it, I'm stunned at how simple it is. The clutch is very easy to operate. I have a ton of space. I've got a ton of room in every regard. I got a ton of knee room, leg room, headroom, maybe not a ton of knee room, but more than I did in the Lamborghini Harama, which I recently drove. Yeah, there's no uh, gate on this, huh? I just realized that. This is the old, the truly old school. I, I'm really surprised by how easy it is just to get started. You know, the clutch is in Ferraris. The clutch is in the, the, the Testarossa's clutch. That was an 80s car. Um, it was so heavy and so difficult. And this car, it's a joy. I'm serious. I'm really surprised by how easily drivable this car is. I assumed it would require all sorts of annoying compromises, like many later Ferraris. And even though this one is earlier, it doesn't. All right, I'm flying here. people have floated in a V12 Ferrari from the 60s. That's a very cool thing. It isn't that fast. I mean, by modern standards, it's like, eh, it's nothing special. I'm behind an Elantra. It's probably about the same, zero to 60. That's where the similarities end with these two cars. This is incredible. 
this experience, I mean, I look around and it's the most beautiful interior. The mirror is so useless. It's mounted literally next to my shoulder. I can barely see out of it. It's so tiny. There's an Accord back there who has no idea that if we crashed, it would just be the worst thing that's ever happened. This is so cool. It is not incredibly loud. You know, ultimately this car was the luxury build. This was the one you got if you wanted the touring, you know, the leather and all that. And, and it feels like that. I mean, this car feels like something, it honestly feels like something I could sit in for a long time and drive. Uh, the seat is very comfortable. There's not much support right behind your head. There's nothing really above the middle of my back. But otherwise, the seat is really comfortable. Visibility goes on for days because there's no crash structure, so the pillars are incredibly tiny. It's such a special car. I'm actually surprised by how not loud it is. I'm also just surprised by how drivable it is. I've got a lot of room. Uh, it, it's easy to drive. The clutch is easy to operate. The accelerator is easy to operate. It's amazing how much exotic cars and sports cars, their steering has become so much more precise over the years. This car is very drivable on sweeping corners, staying in your lane, but uh, you know, I can move the steering wheel inches and nothing really happens. I mean, this is a different era of car. And the funny thing is this would have been considered tremendously sporty and high performance and good handling at that time. It feels relatively secure. I always kind of know where I'm putting it and all that sort of stuff. I don't feel like it's gonna get away from me. Uh, but it certainly isn't direct and communicative. You turn the wheel and it's, it kind of does what it does eventually. It isn't like a, a removed from the driving experience. Modern cars are so uh, quiet and comfortable and easy inside, even exotics. In this car, you feel everything a little bit more, but not that much more. It's very comfortable. I'm just really surprised by that. This is no F40 even. It's certainly no 250 GTO. This is not a, a race car. It's this vintage Ferrari experience. I mean, this is a tremendously special experience. Oh, kind of like BLS. I've never seen one of those before. Terrible car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, listen to that. Oh, that's so wonderful. The thing about this car is these vintage cars, they're they're all about the experience, and this car especially, I mean, this, this feeling you get from a 60s Ferrari, just the simple feeling of climbing inside and of driving it. It's something you just can't replicate in modern vehicles, and it's so special and so cool. The thing about this car and driving it, you just get this incredible feeling. And this car is very expensive, but it isn't special because it's very expensive. The reason it's so valuable is because of how special it is. Um, it's a feeling you just can't get, and a style you just can't get, and a look at the interior and the materials and the brand name. I mean, that plays a role, but it's hard to deny Ferrari. And this era of Ferrari was so wonderful and so special. And that's what has driven the value of these cars up. So that's the Ferrari 250 GT Lusso. You will never be able to afford this car. I will never be able to afford this car, but we can still look and gawk and think about how cool Ferrari was back in the 60s when they sold road cars only so they could finance their racing team. This car is tremendously special. It comes from Ferrari's best era, the 1960s, and it is one of the most beautiful and special and rarest cars, and that is why it's worth every penny of two to three million dollars. Anyway, now it's time to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, this one is obvious. The Lusso is tremendously beautiful and stylish, and it gets a 10 out of 10. It's the opposite for acceleration. 0 to 60 comes in 7.5 seconds, and the Doug score acceleration scale gives it a 1 out of 10. Handling is fine, but nowhere near as good as modern sports cars, and it gets just a 4 out of 10. Cool factor is an obvious one. This is the kind of car that people stop to gawk at during Monterey Car Week when Enzos are just driving around, and it gets a 10 out of 10. Finally, there's importance. This is a very special car for Ferrari and for the vintage car world, but it falls just short of the upper crust of significance as it isn't the more desirable 250 GTO or GT Short Wheelbase or California Spider, all of which have been far more mythologized than Lusso, and it gets a 9 out of 10. Added up and the total weekend score is 34 out of 50, which is pretty good for a 50 plus year old car. Next up are the daily categories, starting with features, and the Lusso simply has nothing. By modern standards, it's hopelessly lacking and it gets a 1 out of 10. Next up is comfort, and the Lusso is shockingly comfortable and roomy, and the ride is impressively forgiving and it gets a 6 out of 10, which I totally didn't expect. Next up is quality. Maintenance is probably a challenge with this old school V12 and few people left willing to work on it, but you can't deny just how incredibly gorgeous this car is and it gets an 8 out of 10. 
Practicality, the Lusso has a reasonably large trunk, but only two seats ensure it won't beat a three out of 10. Finally, there's value, and yes, the Lusso is monstrously, hilariously expensive at $3 million, but with short wheelbases selling for 10 million and California Spiders hitting 15 and 250 GTOs pulling 40, it seems like a bargain, and we know it'll never lose value, so it gets a seven out of 10, bringing the total daily score to 25 out of 50. Add it up, and the total Doug score is... 59 out of 100, roughly right in the middle, and really impressive for a car that was built during John F. Kennedy's presidency.